Good. Plenty of folks in here. Welcome to BCS, the Chartered Institute for IT, our latest uh, webinar. We started, this is a series of webinars to support the vital workers in IT. Uh, we're moving on now uh, in other ways to do things of um, more immediate interest, perhaps uh, can, more con contemporary current stuff. It couldn't be more contemporary than location services. And I'm just going to hold this up because uh, a lot of you will recognize what that is. And it will tell you that I'm in an area where there's a medium uh, chance of uh, getting COVID, um, the most obvious application of location services right now. Um, so we've got an expert panel to discuss this stuff with us. I'm going to get them to introduce themselves. So perhaps I'd come to you first of all, Charles, can you uh, uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, uh, and uh, that'd be great. Uh, so yeah, my name's Charles Canelli. Um, I am the Chief Technology Officer for Esri UK. And um, we specialize basically in location services. So trying to help people understand the world using geography. Um, it's what I'm passionate about. Uh, and uh, it's a really interesting time because people are more aware of the need for managing things using location than at any point in history. So, Thank you, Charles. Chris, could you introduce yourself for us? Yes, uh, well, fellow of the BCS and for 10 years, I, uh, I did the Future Tech blog for the BCS. Um, I've been doing futures work and innovation work for something like 30 years. Um, my first uh, seminar on location-based services was in 1999 at the launch of a Demos project. Uh, so it's been going on for a long time. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. And Bill, could you introduce yourself for us? Thanks. So I'm Bill Mitchell. I'm Director of Policy at BCS. Uh, previously, I've been an academic in various universities as a computer scientist and also in industry. I used to work for Motorola in the European Research Labs for a number of years. And, and my main interest in this is not so much because I am an expert in any of the kind of location based stuff. It's the interest in, in how we ensure we've got the right kind of policy framework coming from government so that we all benefit from this and we don't end up inadvertently sleepwalking into some sort of surveillance state that we're not quite so comfortable with. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. So uh, we're looking forward to this uh, conversation that I certainly am. I'd like to start with two bits of housekeeping, if that's OK. The first is um, I realise that uh, our panel has a, a, a rather gender gendered slant. Uh, this is the first time this has happened in this series. Um, but uh, so, so I'm just going to apologise for it, first of all, but also say I do know we have a, an expert panel. so. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll carry on from there. Uh, the second thing I'm going to say is you will see at the bottom of your screen, of course, as you all probably know now in Zoom, there's a Q&A section. We've already had some questions sent in uh, on the uh, email that was set up on the, uh, the original event page, but uh, please put questions in for the panel. Usually we have a half hour conversation and 15 minutes or so of questions. Uh, however, sometimes we mix that up. So uh, we, uh, we're quite happy to take things on the fly. So please put questions in there. So let's start, uh, shall we, with the, um, it's not even the elephant in the room really, is it? The, 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 the track and trace uh, that we've now been perhaps playing with for the last week or so. Um, what are the issues are there? Um, uh, what are the problems with it? What's the good things about it? Let's start off with Charles, as this is your area, Charles. Tell us a bit about what you feel about the app. Uh, so just just before the app itself, just um, the if if you, location is a very powerful um, piece of information because what it essentially does is, is it allows you to find out things that are related just by the fact that they're in the same place. They've got a similar geographic location, or they're upstream of you, or close by you. It, essentially, it's a way of tying together multiple data sets and asking questions. And if you if you look at the effort that companies have put into tracking your online presence. They think it's really important to understand where you are online and what your interests are because they can market you and that data is very valuable. That's you know, th there's a huge effort that goes in to try and track people across websites and so on, because that digital location is really important. In the in the physical world, the same thing applies. If you know where somebody is, you know what's nearby them, you know who they've interacted with, you know who their friends are, you know where they go on holiday, you you know a huge amount about them and their interests, and it can be quite an intrusive thing and a very powerful thing. So privacy is very, very important. When you add location into it, it becomes critical because you can, you can tell things about people that they don't, they don't know they're exposing. So it's just really important to understand that and the potential for use and misuse of that, of that power. Yeah. We saw in, I think it was South Korea, where they, they published information around tracking trace of individuals who were infected. 
um, so that they can, and they're very successful in controlling. It. But what they did was re they revealed things about people having affairs and all sorts of issues because they were exposing where these people were and who was there with them. Uh, so it, it can be, you know, a really problematic thing. In the case of track and trace here in the UK, it's a difficult thing once again to, to properly track and trace and know who has been where and what the infection risk is. You really would track everybody down to submeter at all points because you, the current app works on a proximity. I'm close to you, therefore there's a chance that we are going to um, cross infect. But what it doesn't tell us is I went through that door 15 minutes before you and I put my hand on that door and you've come along 15 minutes later and you've done the same thing because it's simply a snapshot. It's a sample, which can be useful, but it's not the full picture. Yeah. And unfortunately, the full picture has huge privacy implications, which we have to tackle head on. I mean, let's talk about some of that as well. Bill, your, your angle is very much the policy sort of angle. What's your view of the, of the, of the very latest thing we've got on our phones? It's a really interesting one because you, you, you are talking about weighing up the benefits we get from public health improvements, knowing something. I mean, the, the app isn't going to be perfect. It's going to do loads of false positives, loads of false negatives, but it'll also give you a lot of good information as well. So, and let's face it, it's not, it's not just it'll save lives. It actually could save people ending up in hospital. And if you're not in hospital, then actually, or if you do get into hospital, this, this COVID virus can do a hell of a lot of damage to your lungs, which is going to be long, long-term suffering for you. So in terms of public health benefits, there's massive, massive potential benefit there. We would all want that. So we are talking about how much of our own personal freedoms we are willing to give up to gain that public health benefit. And where it gets tricky is the public health benefits are population wide. So I'm giving up some of my freedoms to help a load of other people. And if I'm selfish, then I don't care about other people. I don't want to give up my personal freedoms to help all those other people that I'm never even gonna meet. So that throws another interesting bit into the mix. Uh, and uh, again, there's this question about, well, how safe is the data? Who's got access to the data? How are they sharing the data? How long is it going to last this data? Um, unfortunately, some parts of our government haven't exactly had a glowing track record in their ability to either protect data or to guarantee the way the data is going to be used. So again, there are lots of trade-offs around that. Um, what I think has been really positive though, so far about this thing is they open sourced the whole app. So everybody's been able to have a look at it. I think that's a really good thing. They have now done a data impact on it really good thing. Um, I think they do really want to be doing the right thing. They are trying to be ethical. So that's incredibly positive. One of the difficulties around all of this kind of emergent technology is you think you're being ethical, but you can't, uh, you can't map out what the unintended uses or abuses of this stuff are. So trying to future proof the way you are being ethical around these things is flaming difficult. And that's yeah. one of the things I think that really we all need to get our heads around. Very interesting. Now, Chris, you, you take a, a view, um, well, from 1999, I think you said your first yeah. uh, event of this nature was. And I know you've got quite a view on the ethical sort of considerations. How have they evolved in that time since your first um, event? Well, I, I mean, for me, the probably the single biggest challenge is the same as it was in 1999 which is in regard to um, social inclusion. So if you take the current COVID um, app as an, an example, the biggest challenge that we face is that um, I, iPhones more than three years old or many Android phones are too old to actually take the app. Now, if you look at the part of the population that doesn't have access to a modern iPhone and a modern Android phone, then it is going to be the elderly and the poor. And if you look at the demographics of those who are most likely to get the worst COVID, they are the people who are least likely to be protected. So I think the difficulty we've got is using a generic device like a smartphone actually means that the information that we're getting is actually on the part of the population that has the least likelihood of mortality or long COVID. So there's a real challenge here as to whether we get some false comfort from this or that the data we get doesn't actually help protect the most vulnerable. And I think that that problem was there in 99 uh, in there and it's still there. Um, and, you know, so 
th that is that is my concern that we're, we're going to find that um, we'd probably be better off making a single use watch or wearable device that was trackable for this kind of application than relying upon a generic platform um and 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 that that is where I think it starts to get um, quite tricky because, of course, that then creates a lot of ethical things about whether you could then mandate somebody to wear a government-issued location device. So that's that's where I think the policy problems get really difficult. And, and to, sorry, just on that, we, we do that at the moment to a subset of society. We do it with people who are who are being tagged as offenders. Mm, yes, and technology is obviously there, but the implications are huge. Uh, in an ideal world, I think you would. Ideal being, if we genuinely want to track and, and tackle the virus at source, you would have some sort of tag that everybody wore and you would track their location down to a meter. But the implications of it are horrifying if it's handled in the wrong way. So we, we're talking about actually exacerbating the digital, the, the digital divide that already exists, yeah. uh, just in a different um, just in a different context there. Now, we've already had some questions coming on the Q&A, so I'm going to come to some of these actually straight away. Uh, the first couple, actually, Charles, about your um, your albums just behind you. There. <laughs> well, I'm very pleased with that. I'm happy I'm to say I've got spotted Ziggy Stardust. I can't see what the other one is, but uh, maybe, maybe we'll likes, go through them later. <laughs> somebody likes them anyway, but uh, but we'll put that to one side for now. Um, here's a, a comment from Lawrence Mosley. One concern is undue government or commercial surveillance. The second one is the location. Uh, use of location data by criminals. Knowing where someone is at a given point means that you also know where they are not. Then that may lead them open, for example, to having their empty home burgled. Does location data need different security mechanisms? Who'd like to take down different security mechanisms? Perhaps Charles. Yeah, your yeah I, I, I don't think it requires different. It needs security mechanisms and location obfus, ob, obfuscation. I can never say the word. Um, is something that's really important. It's, it's actually applied at the moment. So uh, people like the ONS, when they're doing census things, it's very easy to actually identify individuals by accident because the sample sizes in some areas are quite small. So there are established techniques for sort of spreading your location around and, and hiding it for certain things, but it's so powerful as a, as a source of generating information about somebody. I think we need to approach privacy in a totally different way than we do today. Right now, we're not in control of it as individuals. And, and I think we need to think through that. And one area that I, I think we should consider is the music industry faced a problem years ago that people could suddenly start ripping their music and sharing it online with no control. And what they've done over the last 20 years is they have enforced digital rights management where the publisher of the music decides who's able to play it. And it is controlled at an operating system level, at a silicon level, so that you can't play music you're not licensed to, to take. And there's a profit motive which has driven that. I think we should be taking a similar approach with our privacy, where there's some mechanism for enforcing the privacy and the use of our data that we want to do and a time limit on that usage. And that should be enforced at operating system at silicon level. We should value our, 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 our privacy and our location data and other types of information in the same way we do something as you know, like music, for example. It's totally possible to do technically, it's been proven. We just don't seem to have got the motivation to do it. What, what, what would it take to, to create the will or the, um, the the thirst for that kind of control? Have you any thoughts on that, Bill, from our BCS perspective? Yeah, because one of the things we find over and over is, you know, if you're in the tech industry, if you understand the technology and implications, then you realise the potential harms that might occur. But when you talk to people who are not in the IT industry, they are the public, they go, oh, no, there's no problem with me sharing my data with all of these Silicon Valley companies and the rest of the world. I don't care. Well, that, whereas actually that's, it isn't that they don't care. They don't understand the risks that there are, you know. Um, say, for example, if you're in a particular American state and you were going in a taxi to, say, a, an abortion clinic and that actually became publicly knowledgeable because they'd worked out from your location what you were doing, in, if you were in the wrong state in America, that could have really appalling consequences for your personal life. Uh, yeah. But people don't get it. They don't realize the harms that might occur. And therefore we can't, it's really difficult to have an informed, intelligent debate with the public where they can really unpick what it is they're prepared to accept and to, to not accept. I think the COVID app is a really good example where there was quite a bit of scaremongering about certain things. Some of it was justifiable, some of it wasn't. And that created quite a negative public backlash. What's been very positive, I think, about the, the new app is it's been downloaded by, I think, about 15 million people. So actually, myself, I reckon that's quite a positive thing in terms of public health uh, 
uh, angle. So again, when you try and talk to people about how you would protect their, their data, uh, their, their, their locations, it's difficult for them to understand it. So I think our biggest challenge is getting across to just normal people who, who aren't right into the technology precisely what this means for you and why you need to care about this and also why it's valuable for you as an individual too. Mm. Good. So um, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, a specific question, actually, I'll just bring this over to you, Chris. Uh, do, do you think, or the, ask the panel, that the privacy, the app privacy statement is adequate? I don't know if you've all had a chance to read that, or <laughs> I know what we often do with those things. Okay. Um, I, I think the point is that we, we get into some really interesting things where it isn't necessarily just us that's being tracked. So if you take things around driverless cars, it is where the car is. And of course, if the car gets stolen, it's quite useful to be able to do it. But of course, if there's somebody in it, you're tracking that person without actually having it necessarily, even if I've got my phone switched off, you can track where I might be traveling if you know I'm in that car. Um, we've had similar problems over the ethics of, uh, of smart meters, about what can you find about what a person is doing in their home by tracking the energy usage of their home. And so, for instance, discovering that people are watching um, porn channels at three o'clock in the morning by watching peaks in their consumption, energy usage and patterns uh, is something that's been proven to be possible um, through the use of smart meters. So I think the point is it isn't just our individual privacy by tracking us. It's tracking the increasing amount of things around us that actually have some sort of location data in them. Um, and we're creating more and more of these potentials, be it our house, our office, uh, our car. Um, so I, I think that the, the privacy now, we've, we've got to think of it in a much broader sense about if I get into that car, is that, do I give that car permission to track me? Yeah. Yeah, that's where I think we're heading. And that's why I think we have to think much more deeply about the policy of privacy in this new world. So we'll, we'll come on to some of the policy um, and legislative issues in a moment, because obviously that's going to be key to this. There's a couple of more technical type questions just coming on the Q&A. And uh, Charles, I'm terribly sorry, I'm probably going to dump these on you. <laughs> a couple of these. Um, uh, the first one is this, uh, the privacy policy for the contract tracing app states that data will be held for 14 days. Doesn't that mitigate the privacy concerns to a certain extent? It, I think it does, you know, and I think the, the privacy statement, I've not read it in detail, I have skimmed it. It seems to me reasonably adequate and thought through and the intention is good. Mm. The problem is that you're reliant on those people carrying out that, and I'm sure they will do in this case, but you're reliant upon the organizations that you give your data to, to, to deleting that data after 14 days rather than you having control of it. That's why I think we need to have a mechanism by which when I use the app, I say, I'm, I'm interacting with this app, I agree with your privacy statement, and then that is enforced technically, so that 14 days later, my data yeah. goes. It's, yeah. you know, there's an encryption mechanism around it, very like the system which is used for digital rights management for things as trivial as movies and, and books and so on. That, that's why I think it's such an important concept is who's in control, basically. Yes. On the technical side, someone else also comments, Tim Glover says, am I right in thinking that the two meter proximity doesn't take into account whether, for example, there's a wall between you? It, it doesn't, it's simply how close, all I would say is that a wall between you attenuates the signal so that it will seem like you're, you're wider apart um, mm. depending on the wall type. But yes, fundamentally, it's simply looking at, are these two phones within a distance of each other? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's all there is, there's, there's you know, nothing particularly clever beyond that. Yeah, okay. So let's look at the, uh, dig a little bit more into the policymaker legislator sort of view. Uh, perhaps I can come to you first, Bill. What do you think the current understanding level is amongst those that are actually making these decisions on a policy level? Because you say the public perhaps don't think implications. I wonder if the same might be true of our legislators and uh, policy people as well. Yeah, I, th I think it varies a very great deal. Um, and um, a little moan I have about uh, policymakers is that we frequently work with some really fabulous civil servants. And then after 18 months, they move on to a different job. And then we get a whole different bunch of civil servants. And that, that, that that's great from their career progression point of view, but it's really difficult to, to build up a base of expertise within the government. 
and it shouldn't you shouldn't really be expecting the politicians to have that level of expertise but you should be expecting the civil servants to be able to provide that level of expertise so i think there are, there are issues around having a um, systematic expertise base across different government departments where they can leverage that expertise within a technology um, policy debate um, so what I think those folks need to uh, think through is how they engage with the technology community to get that information to them in ways that they can use purposefully and intelligently to come up with the right policy base. Um, and that's something I think government needs to work at and be better at. You know, it definitely does try, but I think it needs to try harder, especially given the kind of need for instant responses to things like pandemics, which clearly, hasn't quite been the way we would have all liked it to be. I think one of the other things that's really interesting from a government point of view in terms of policy, if we think about the way the app was developed, um, the, what, to some extent, public health policy has been determined by what Silicon Valley technology companies have allowed the UK government to do. So to some extent, policy decisions about public health in England have been dictated by the technology choices of the companies that provide Android and Apple. Now, it may be they've made the right choices for our public health, but I think what would have been rather helpful is if we'd have been allowed to be part of the debate when those technology companies did actually dictate what it is we were going to be allowed to have or not have in our track and trace app. So for a government, that's really hard. They're struggling with the, with the, the expertise within their own policy making um, function and they're up against technology companies that have decided in advance what their public health policies are going to be and then they're going to impose them on the UK government. So that does suggest there are some serious issues here that need working through and how best in the future we can have a meaningful dialogue between government, the IT industry and public <laughs> that is actually informed. Yes. Yeah. Um, can I push back a little on that? Um, and the reason I want to push back on it is that um, a few years ago, um, one of the big problems, if you take the iPhone, was that the time on a single charge was actually falling version to version. So between iPhone 4, 5 and 6, the amount of time in the day before you needed to recharge it um, was dropping. Um, my wife is a doctor and she needs about a nine hour life minimum. Um, for a single battery charge. If, if Apple had carried on continually by about iPhone 10 or 11, you'd have had about a two hour charge. So the way they, and big problem is Bluetooth because Bluetooth is very heavy on power consumption um, with these kind of apps. So the, the problem is that the, this, and in fact, I would say about some of the software people involved in some of the decisions on the apps, was that they didn't look at the power consumption early enough. It took me 10 minutes to work out that the original government app wouldn't work. Um, because in a hospital setting, for instance, a doctor might walk past a thousand people in two hours. And so the trouble is your battery life on your phone, if it was always working, would be down to two to three hours. Well, you can't do that on a shift. So I think that there's, there is a, in fact, I think the silos within our own industry have now become a problem. So there are hardware people and there are software people. And I don't think that they talk to each other often enough. So some of the security people I talk to, when I explain the power problems, um, if they were talking to people inside government and the software people were talking to people inside government, there wasn't a joined up response from the industry on this matter. And that, and that, that does concern me because it then gives the impression that we don't know what we're talking about to, to the political class. I think the point I was making, though, was that, um, and I'm not saying it was the wrong decision that was made, no. I'm a decision was made by technology companies that had massive public health implications, but they decided in advance without talking to anybody in the British public what the, what the solution was they were going to present. And I, and I feel that that's the bit that was missing. There wasn't, and, and then there is also the problem, you're in a crisis, so you have to do something now in order to try and solve the crisis. But surely... If a technology company is going to say, right, folks, sorry, we're not going to let you have that public health solution. You've got to have this public health solution. There should have been a debate with the with with us, the public, who are going to be the ones at the end of that public health decision. Mm. 
another factor that we've we've seen on this as well is that um, the understanding of location and how you can make use of it when you're constructing queries and designing systems is pretty poor in the UK. It's it's a very poorly taught subject. Most data scientists that we come across actually don't they're not they're not comfortable working with location data. They they quite often don't use it. They use it as a way of presenting the answer. Here's a map of what I found, but they don't use it they don't have an innate understanding of what you can do in the issues around it. And we've seen that play out because people try and do location focused apps and, and tackle it in the wrong way. So there's a real need, I think, to get a better understanding of location as a core capability of data scientists, of software developers and so on. And it's fundamentally not really taught um, in the UK outside of more specialized geographically focused courses. Just to, uh, just to pursue a, a, a little part of what you just said there, Charles, if you don't mind. So one of the questions we had come in um, from a panelist, yet, uh, from a, a user yesterday was, does the COVID-19 app use geospatial tracking or not? Do we, do we really know? Can you just pick that one up for us? It's, it's fundamentally a proximity app. It's not actually using your location. As far as I know, it's, it's asking for GPS access when you install it. But fundamentally, the core technology is just, are you in the same place? But the location services on those phones use whatever they can find to work yeah. out where you are, which is a mixture of GPS and Wi-Fi signal and so on. But the way the app at its core works is no, it's just it's just a proximity app, uh, which is using almost like as a, a proxy for location. Yeah. Okay. Now um, I just thought that was uh, just worth uh, highlighting. Actually, um, I've got another question here. So um, <laughs> we know the situation with uh, the crossover with all, all things that are going on at the moment. So Timothy Wilson asks, what are the issues? Uh, around SHRMS 2 and the likelihood that some data or IP data may be transferred to the US. Uh, what's the legal crossover there with this app? And who'd like to pick up that particular thorny? Uh, Bill's smiling. Let's go to Bill. That's a flipping difficult question. Um, <laughs> and what, what you are allowed to do or not at the moment. Um, certainly, the, there are some lawyers who are, who are putting forward the case that be, because of the um, um, technical regulations around what the Americans can't, can and can't do with foreigners' data, as in ours, which is very, very different from what Americans would do with American citizens' data, we're almost at the point where it's impossible, theoretically, to be allowed to, to, trans, um, to export data to the States. Well, mm, at the same time, it's going to be. Um, and then the, the question is, how likely is it that there will be uh, any, um, well, is somebody going to get sued over this? Probably. Um, how much of an impact is this going to have? Well, it could have a huge impact if we don't sort out what our data, data adequacy arrangements are with the European Union, um, because we also have to be able to transmit stuff to them and back. So uh, it's a bit of the pig's ear at the moment. Yeah. I think that's probably the, the most professional answer I can give. <laughs> Chris, you were smiling when I asked that question. And if you yeah, I that. think I think pig's ears could sue for that. Um, <laughs> it, no, I, I, I mean, I think we are in a period of enormous uncertainty um, because, I mean, there are, you know, fairly frequently documented suggestions that the UK wishes to deviate from GDPR. Um, that could delay um, any agreement between ourselves and, and EU. And there are countries um, that are signing up to GDPR that may have, um, you know, so Japan and, and EU have agreements on data interchange as part of the trade agreement. So it's going to get messy. And I don't know, it, it could be six, nine months before we have any sort of clarity um, at the moment, um, unless we get some sort of hold, um, sort of temporary arrangement. Um, and it will, if, it will affect some of our industries, such as um, financial services, it will affect manufacturing. Um, so there are there are there are some there there are there are real problems to which we do not have answers and will not have answers for some while. Yeah, um, I'm just looking at some of the questions that are coming in here. Um, they're really interesting because they range from the larger policy type questions that we're talking about right down to very specific questions for which I'm not sure we as a panel have an answer. I'll give you an example of one of them. Um, could the police demand surrender of a mobile to enforce any of the COVID fines? I don't know what the answer to that is, but maybe one of one of you didn't, probably not. But that shows the complexity of these issues from a personal right up to the 
to the uh, policy level, doesn't it? So perhaps rather than dig down too much there, I'd, I'd just like to go on to another question I had in our original um, uh, setup for this, which is how can we help policymakers? So perhaps we can just take that. Um, those in government, those that make the decisions, how can we get them to make better informed decisions for us? Bill, you must have a view on that. Yeah, I mean, we, we found we've made much more progress with policymakers where we, we don't just go, oh, this is terrible, isn't it? Where we actually go, this is terrible, but here are some possible solutions that you could think about, and here, here's how they could be implemented. And that gets a lot more traction. So I think when you're actually talking to policymakers and you go, okay, let me explain how this could be solved in a way that the voter will care about, the electorate will care about, and how the electorate will benefit, that's a solution you could consider Here's the costs, here's the benefits. That makes much more progress than um, sort of getting people n uh, nervous because there's a big issue and it might cause all sorts of problems and harms. I, th I think that's, for us, what we found over the last 10 years, that's the best way of, of getting some actual traction with policymakers. Yeah, and Charles, I know you've got some very strong feelings about the sort of legislative approach to these sorts of things as well. Yeah, and, and I, I think the, the legislators, we have a responsibility as a technical industry to present ways of, of tackling these problems. I you know, completely agree with what Bill said there. And I think that, uh, you know, going on the same thing again, looking at, we have digital rights management enforced very stringently across all the devices and computers that we operate across the websites and so on. We should take that same approach and apply it to our own data, our own, you know, we should have privacy rights management that extends right down to the manufacturer of the chips themselves so we can enforce this stuff. The question about the pig's ear question, you know, we, we can get somebody to agree that they're not going to look at that data, but the data is still there and they can look at it. So mm -hmm. how do you enforce that? We need uh, some mechanism by you know, the cryptographic solutions that we come up with some other things could be applied to this problem. So uh, I think what we can do as an industry is think of how could you tackle this? The implications are there. We've all discussed them. If you look at, um, you know, it is t technically possible for us to arm everybody in the UK. Some countries have experimented with that approach. We've decided as a society we don't want to do that. And we've put legislation and control in place to, to stop it happening. There's still, you know, exemptions to some of these things, but we can decide to do things differently. And I think what we can bring is, is a mechanism by which this could be enforced and managed and think through that aspect as an industry. Yeah. I suppose the implications of arming people is that when they see the consequences very quickly of um, using arms, don't they? Whereas they don't with, for example, Bluetooth. Uh, Rick, Rick Chandler's just put a little message in here. Bluetooth has always had security vulnerabilities. Absolutely. Uh, and has always warned about that. It should not be permanently switched on. Although we are asking people to do that at the moment. It's too convenient. Do they understand the implications of, I mean, Chris, what's your perspective on the understanding the public have of Bluetooth, which has been in phones for years? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I want to sort of look at that. My experience over 30 odd years is to understand, you have to understand the political cycle. So in the two years run up to an election, the best way to engage with the public policy debate is not, is not with the ministers, it's with the think tanks. And to look at the public policy areas, health, education, transport, industry 4.0, whatever it is, and try to socialize some of the opportunities that will then go into the manifestos. At this stage of the um, of this electoral cycle, where the government uh, still expects to be in power for three or four years, it's actually very difficult to get them to do anything unless it solves a, an immediate problem. And the trouble is trying to educate senior civil servants and senior ministers when dealing with an emergency is in my experience impossible. So the best thing to do actually, I think is that, and one of the things I think our industry could do better um, is to actually engage with the think tanks across the political spectrum, because many of those people um, that you will meet there will become SPADs, will become MPs, will become ministers in three, five, 10 years time. And you will actually create a cadre of people coming through who are much more versed in this and I think that's a much more long-term and sustainable way of dealing with it is by taking some of these public policy areas like health in a broader sense and say, how could the internet of things, big data, technology, AR, VR, robotics, improve the health service? And you can get that through the reports. Um, and, and, I, and I found that to be a far more rewarding way 
um, than trying to get very, very busy people to acquire large amounts of new knowledge in what are complex uh, and multifaceted areas like ours. Interesting comment I've had here then, um, which I'll put to the um, panel from Stephen Castell. Uh, he said that, uh, he said from the outset of the lockdown that this idea of the app with the geolocation and smartphone mobile number must leave you to become a national ID and uh, the dynamic database there of a protected public asset if we're to effectively fight this uh, virus. What do the panellists think of that approach? I'd like to pick that one up. Charles looks keen. <laughs> Can you say it again, please, a little bit slower? Sorry. Um, he said um, the, the NHS app, um, in the app, the citizens' geolocations plus smartphone mobile number must legally become a national ID on the mm -hmm. dynamic database there of a protected public asset if we're to fight it effectively. I think it comes back to that point we're making. You know, ideally, we would be able to track everybody, where they've been, what they've done, who they've been close to, which, when they're in the same room, when they've touched the same door. That's that. If you really want to tackle the virus, that is the extent you would need to go to. And that is very powerful. The implications, obviously, is what we've been talking about of that. So yes, you know, having that ID for us all and that location history and the data history would be the best way of, of fighting something like a virus, uh, as we're doing at the moment. But at the current <laughs> level of control that we have, it's, it's a very dangerous thing. The, the difficulty of specifying precisely which digital attributes define your ID, I think, is um, um, technically could be hugely flawed. Also, there could be a disjoint set of attributes which equally uniquely identify you as an individual. And that one isn't the legal definition, but actually it can be used in the same way. So trying to say those three things uniquely define you and must be used by law, I think technically could be very flawed. Uh, the idea that your digital identity is something that has a, a legal standing uh, with legal obligations and legal rights, that's certainly something that is interesting and maybe something we want to do. But I think it, the, the mistake, though, is to, is to say in advance it has to be those three things because it yeah. actually people could use other, other stuff. But it, but it comes back fundamentally to that digital rights management, which is an awareness of identity, how it's being used, what data is attached to it and what it can be used for, enforced mm -hmm. at a level where it, you know, it can't be broken. Yeah. So I'd like to um, also just talk a little bit about how quickly these conversations become political, because um, BCS is, is apolitical as an organisation, which for me gives us a, 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 a stronger platform. But I've noticed, um, obviously on Twitter, <laughs> that very quickly, even discussions about the app have become more, don't call it the NHS um, track and trace app, call it the Circo track uh, trace it, although apparently they weren't involved in the, in the development of it, but obviously there's a political point being made there, isn't there? So uh, I, I'm, I'm going to come to Bill on this. Should we be a bit, a little bit stronger about our approach that it is, uh, you know, political party agnostic and actually to do with the, the, the technologies? I think it's to do with the public benefit. There are some technologies that can be used for the public benefit or not. And it's our job as the professional body for IT to try and inform the public about what it means to them, what it really means to them, what the potential harms and unintended consequences that might happen, and try and get them to understand the principles behind the technology that they need to be informed about and they need to be engaging with policymakers about. Um, I think for me, the best example of this is algorithm. You know, six months ago, nobody cared about algorithm. A-level results come out, everybody's talking about algorithm. Um, and, uh, you know, you were seeing um, students holding up placards which said, F the algorithm, you know? And that really got it into people's consciousness. Suddenly everybody wants to know about algorithms and what they're being used for and how they work and what it means. It's the job of people like us, not just ours, but it is part of our job to make sure that we try and explain to the world at large that algorithms are essential for the functioning of the digital world. They do a huge amount of good and bad, in equal measure, it's the people that design them, it's the people that implement them, it's the people that execute them. Those are the ones you've got to make sure are competent and ethical and trustworthy to produce the right kind of algorithms. And I think the other aspect to this thing around uh, you know, personalized location-based data is yes, we need the right sort of technology solutions to try and impose that they are used correctly, but we also need to make sure that as a profession, we are accountable for what's going on and the public actually can trust us 
So I think those are also very, very important parts of this. So in terms of the kind of political thing, we are apolitical, but that doesn't stop us saying, well, OK, folks, how are we going to make sure this, that, those, that, that those professionals actually are professional and they are accountable and they are doing the right thing? So, yeah. Thank you, Phil. So, um, well, we've had loads of questions in. We've got a few more. We're not going to get onto all of these because we are 40 minutes into our 45 minutes, but, uh, uh, which has been excellent. So we, we've got just a few minutes just to have some closing remarks, if, if you wouldn't mind, um, uh, my, my panellists here. Um, really, it's about the road ahead. What should happen next? Now, I've been really interested with the digital rights management uh, thinking there. So I'm sure you've each got some thoughts as to just how we should carry on from here. Obviously, we don't know the effectiveness of this app yet in its early days, but uh, perhaps I could start with you, Charles. Where, where should we be going next? What should we be thinking about next? Um, I think we should be having this discussion more widely. You, you've seen the level of interest just in this short short discussion right now. It's, it's a, there's nothing more powerful than where I am. When, when Google Earth was released, the first thing everybody did was look at their house. And the second thing they did was look at their neighbor's house. You know, we, we are personal in that way. So I think what we should be doing is trying to raise awareness and understanding and use of location information. And I think that we should be looking at our responsibility as an IT provision uh, profession to provide solutions that can be used in societal context that will actually make decisions people make enforceable and practical. That, but acknowledging everything, Bill, that you said there, I completely agree in terms of the responsibility to, you know, that we have as well to explain and make sure people understand that and that they can hold us accountable. Lovely. Thank you, Charles. Chris, what's your view of the, of the next steps? Well, I, I think it's, I, I've, I've always argued that technologies are defined both by what they can do, but also by their limits. And one of the things that does concern me is that, um, you know, can, can we actually trust the data? So to, just to give you one personal example, um, I have never visited my home according to my Google timeline. Um, it says that my, my home is about 300 yards in that direction on the other side of Little Woodland. So I've never actually been here. Now, the problem is that if there was an incident there, we've had examples already where the US police force have asked for the release of location-based data to track crimes. Well, if there was a crime at that address where they think my phone is, I have never been there, but my phone has been there every day, allegedly. So the thing is that there is that discrepancy. And I think we have to be realistic about the fact that these things are you know, we keep saying we can do this. We can track these people to a millimeter or a meter or whatever it is. And I think we just have, we had we do have to be realistic and understand what the limits are for mm. each of the different types. And specifically, because you know, I, I blogged about it some time ago. Um, the whole problem with with self driving cars is that they will have to be much much more accurate than we currently are able to do if they are to be safe. Uh, and they have to be more accurate than, than certainly GPS. And I don't know whether, whether we, you know, where the work is being done uh, to make sure that the technologies are ready to be able to take advantage of increased autonomy in vehicles. Mm. Thank you, Chris. Um, uh, we won't start that particular discussion. Uh, you probably know that Elon has just uh, re-forecast when uh, we'll have all yep. those for the fourth or fifth time. But, as I say, we'll go down that rabbit hole. Bill, can we ask you for your, your closing comments on where you think we should be going next? I think the most important thing is to have a location-based coffee delivery. I want to be able to walk down the street in the future and have a drone drop out of the sky and put a cappuccino in my hand because I desperately need a caffeine fix right now. I think that's where we need to be going with location-based services. Um, more seriously, though, I think the really, really big challenge is that a lot of these technologies are going to be used in ways that nobody's ever thought of. You know, when smartphones started, mobile phones started, what was the biggest thing everybody did? Texting. And it was teenagers that drove that. They suddenly discovered they could happily chat with all their mates in class or in, or in the next school through texting. And nobody ever thought that's what that was going to be for. So one of the things we've got to be on top of is the incredibly inventive and imaginative ways people are going to misuse this technology <laughs> that we can't possibly think about. So we've got to be able to react to that and try and repair the harms that happened that we never thought were going to be possible, but at the same time, exploit and take advantage of the really great things we're going to suddenly think of that it just was nobody thought that could be done. Lovely. 
Okay, well, thank you. Well, that 45 minutes uh, has flown by and that was a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much. It seems pretty obvious to me we're going to have to follow this up in a few weeks' time after we get a bit more detail on how this particular app has worked and we'll have more things to talk about. I think we've agreed that it's complex. It's fascinating. Apart from the software, hardware and policy issues, there, there's no problems at all. So uh, that's uh, that's good to know, isn't it? Um, can I say thank you so much to Bill, Chris and Charles for your participation today. Can I thank the attendees? Um, I know this um, um, information went out quite late, but we had a really good attendance today and some good interaction too. And I'll probably take some points from the questions that we haven't got round to, to set up another conversation in a few weeks time. So um, uh, Charles, thank you. Uh, Bill, thank you. Chris, thank you. I'll bring, sure, this, bring this to an end now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.